Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show. This week we are looking at the subject area of becoming an all-round investor. Probably not what you think. It's not property versus shares. It's actually a lot more in-depth than that in terms of some of the major areas in life that once they're under control, certainly make for peace of mind, security, and ultimately a great long-term outcome. Take plenty of notes, but as always, don't just take notes, take action. See you on the show. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show with me, your host, Andrew Baxter, and as always, my offsider and co-host, Mitch Olerenschel. Thank you for having me on the show, Mr. Baxter. Now, jumping straight into today's topic, as a seasoned investor of 30 years that you are, not just in the stock market, but in all areas of life. Today, I want to talk about becoming the all-round investor, that guy or girl that's just basically got everything in their life under control, from relationships to money to everything else in between. Mm, broad subject and uh, a lot we can learn and take out of this. So let's dive in. What have you got for me? Well, I think what's probably an important p- place to start with, AB, would be determining what the notion of being an investor is, mm. not just stock market, property market, but actually beyond that. So in your all words, right. what would you say? Yeah, I think investing is where you you take a considered and deliberate action to 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 apply time or resources into something. You're investing in it. So yeah, you could be investing in your your putting ability. If you're out on the putting green at the golf course somewhere, I should probably spend more time. You'll be both. Um, but yeah, that's an example of you're investing your time and, and and effort into becoming better at golf, for example. So it's a concerted attempt to invest your time uh, and resources on a particular. Uh, challenge, I suppose. I think it's the notion for me personally of Mitch investing time today Mm. for future Mitch tomorrow to be better. I think that's also a key distinction. It's not about the time and the instant result from it. It's actually what you're sort of setting the standout for going forward. And and it's a deliberate intention. Um, Very few things happen in life uh, by accident. It's, I guess, a confluence of planning and deliberate intention and time and energy put towards something delivers an outcome, not just now in the near term or in the immediacy, um, it's it's a long term uh, you know, a timeline you're looking at. So you could argue that you know, learning to trade and invest, for example, may make you a profit in the market today, but the whole process is also about setting you up for a, a better financial future by being able to do that over and over again uh, with a level of consistency. And, and the longer you spend doing it, the, uh, the bigger and better the return will be over time. Absolutely. Well, let's jump into things and mm. noting this would probably be, be quite applicable for a lot of our younger listeners mm. as well. For example, you've got to be you know 18 to buy a property or invest in shares. But if you're 15 or 16 listening to this, only a small fraction, hopefully there's some you know some gold nuggets that they can take away. Well, let's face it, if you're 15 or 16, you've got this blank canvas of life in front of you. And it's so easy to take for granted that you don't have to do anything here and now. You've got plenty of time for it. But the earlier you get started, uh, certainly the earlier you get the job done. I bought my first shares, I think when I was about 15 or 16. So, you know, you can get can get the job done early. Um, so just because you're young doesn't mean to say you're precluded from this. You're setting the, the groundwork in play uh, for, for, for what your future really needs to look at. In fact, if I think about one of our clients not that long ago, um, good old David Zohar bought his daughter through our boot camp, you know, and she was only, I think, 12 or 13 at the time, and she's already you know, trading and making money. So you don't have to wait till you're old enough to make money. You can get started now by learning it. Well, experience is a great teacher, AB. So let's dive into pillar number one, and that is relationships. So investing <laughs> in your partner. Mm. Talk me through what that means. Yeah, look, I, I think... People often take for granted the stability of a, a good home life. And look, let's put a caveat on this because last time, I think when my dad um, sat in that chair actually doing an interview, you know, he had the audacity to say that you know his life was what it was because he married well. And you know, I've got to feel backlash from some people that maybe had married not so well or not put the time into their relationship. Um, having a stable home life makes a massive difference. And as a, as a, a young man, as a bachelor, you know, I guess we spend a, a, a decent amount of time uh, out there in the interviewing stage to get into a relationship, but when you find the right person, being able to stay in that relationship is key. Um, you know, talking to um, a good buddy of mine that's a, a divorce lawyer, talking to my wife who was a divorce lawyer, um, you know, probably one of the most important financial decisions you make is choosing your partner and sticking with your partner through the tough and through the good times. Because, um, you know, if we're using, and it's a very crude measure and it's probably not the right benchmark, um, if we're on this journey of investing and your goal is to, to, to make money, which, you know, this is the Money and in Investing podcast after all, 
the best way of keeping your money is not getting divorced. Uh, I've got a buddy of mine just gone through it. Um, and as we hear every week with people we know that they go through um, you know, a breakup in a relationship. And a lot of the time it's because there's not enough investment in it. You're not growing together. You're not communicating. Um, and it always reminds me, a, a, a dear friend of mine sadly passed away now, um, always used to refer to his wife who was his girlfriend. And they'd be like, oh, Jeanette, you know, come on, come over here, girlfriend. And I, always, and I said, Paul, yeah, you guys have been married for like 23 years. And he gave me a great, great little soundbite. And I'll share that with you now. He said, Andrew, as long as I treat my wife like she's my girlfriend, she'll always want to be my wife. There's a fair bit of fire in that comment. Mm. I like that. And then it's just investing that time, keep the fire alive, um, you know, and respecting that person growing together. Uh, it's hugely important. And if you can stay together, so too does your wealth. Cutting a check for 50%, 60%, 70% of your wealth is not a great wealth creation strategy. So spend the time investing in that relationship and stay there for the right reasons, grow together and have a great life. As I said, there'll be people that go, oh, I was in an abusive relationship. Well, you know, that comes down to, you know, you have to do the right decisions for you at the time. If you're in an abusive relationship, not for a moment are we condoning staying in it um, but we're talking more generically here uh, about some of the things that people do neglect which is not investing in it absolutely i heard a, an, an interesting soundbite not too long ago as well and actually in another episode on a different podcast three biggest financial decisions you can make where you live what you drive and who you marry mm, yeah pretty good that's uh, that's the, the three pivotal ones, uh, and they they can <laughs> they can come back to bite you um, definitely. Yeah, and I mean let's, let's put this into some practical terms. Getting out for a date night. I mean we've got five kids, uh, so you know our time at home is spread thin, uh, as you'd expect with five young kids. But you have to have time for a date night or a date. Uh, that's how you keep a relationship alive. Uh, and oh, I'm too busy to to organise anything. You know, you, you you're running a multi million dollar business with lots of stakeholders and tens of thousands of clients around the world and you can't organize to take your wife out for lunch seriously and it's not that you can't organize it it's not a priority and right at the top of the list it's been the first one you've talked of in terms of what to invest in your relationship has to be your number one priority you get that right everything else flows off the back of it if it's toxic and bad it will disrupt everything else including the bottom line great advice ab thank you very much now diving into one area i'd say I love to invest in, and that is health, mm. going to the gym, going for a run, and in particular, mental health as well, mm. a, much a, a growing area of interest mm. uh, amongst the population. What's your advice from a health perspective? 100%. You don't want to be the richest person in the cemetery. Um, you know, so looking after yourself physically and mentally is absolutely key. Uh, and, you know, again, that notion I'm too busy to do this, and I'm sure we'll get onto time planning uh, as we go through, as seeing as I'm obsessed with it. But, you know, you... you, 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 you have to make time for it because if you if your body is functioning and you're in flow and you feel healthy you've got more energy you can work harder you can work longer you can work in a more focused way mentally in terms of you know the bandwidth of what you can you can handle and 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 blocking it out is is, is such an important part of your daily schedule uh, you know i go back in the days um you know it wasn't I was in the broker. I was at, at one point in time when I was a stockbroker. Um, one of the other guys on the desk and I used to swim every day. Uh, a real old school guy. He's one of life's great characters, sadly no longer with us. And, uh, you know, we'd go up to the pool. He used to have a, a, a roll. So we'd drive up in the rolls and go up and do our laps in the pool. Not bad. And, uh, and, and come back and, 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 you know, people say, how can you make the time in the middle of the day? You know, it's prime time. And it actually isn't. That middle of the day is actually when you start to fatigue, or at least I did. Um, you know, you've, you've been working pretty hard in the morning and that decompression for, you know, it's probably 45 minutes or so all up. And you come back re-energized in the afternoon because you've had that release, that endorphin release of doing exercise. And physically you may be tired, but mentally you're not because, well, in my case, swimming, you know, you're following that black line up the middle of the pool. Um, you, you're not concentrating on the black line and then you're not concentrating any other than thinking about what am I going to do for the rest of the day? What trade ideas have I got? Who have I got to speak to? How am I going to pitch them? So it actually is a very, very important vacuum to create. And I think that's actually one of the great things about swimming versus a number of other sports. I, mean, I used to run and used to do a lot of different things uh, when my body was uh, maybe in marginally better condition. Swimming is one of those things that you are almost distraction free because you're in the water. You're not listening to anything. You're not talking to anybody. You're in your own head. Uh, and it's just you, the line on the bottom of the pool and you're breathing in the water. And so you can actually use that time really, really effectively to really isolate yourself. Uh, and I, I certainly used to do that. We used to do that literally every single day, Monday to Friday, best part of the day and uh, come back and have a ripper afternoon on the back of it. So, you know, it is extremely important, but yeah, you know, mental health also is. Uh, and I think the, 
the notion of you've just got to be busy doing stuff can burn you out. And I think the, you know, the notion of, uh, you know, segmenting your day so that there is time to invest in yourself and, and your mental acuity and your focus and your purpose, you know, you know, the notion of you know, going back over, you know, what are your goals? Are you checking them? Are you on point with them? What do you need to do to modify your behavior? These things go a long way towards reducing your stress and frustration levels, which are two big causes of mental health challenges for people. So it's not wasted time. It is investment in yourself and it gives you that lace of precision so that the actions that you're taking in this moment are leading towards what your long-term goal is you know you know long-term goals are broken down into you know years and quarters and months and weeks and days and hours and minutes and what are you doing right now and having that mental freshness if you will where you're on point you're focused is is crucial because that's how you build momentum that's how you 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 get what you want out of life whether that's you know a big investment portfolio or or not having financial stress or a great relationship or feeling good in yourself whatever yeah it just comes down to Tell you what would be really interesting, AB, if you're listening to this, comment in the comment section what you do for exercise or for mental health. So whether you meditate, do yoga, go to the gym, let us know because I'm sure there's so many people out there that are probably stuck on where to start or what to do. And there's probably a myriad of good ideas mm. down below. Oh, it's so easy to get stuck and in that rut, just do something. doesn't matter what it is. Even if it's the wrong thing, it doesn't matter. Go for a walk, go for a run. In my case, I've got a Peloton bike in my gym at home amongst other things. And I've been using that. I've been actually finding that really good uh, because it's quick, painful, job's done. Embrace the pain. You know we love pain. Love it. And and and, and it's, it, it's it's creating good momentum. So yeah, you know whatever it is, do something. Definitely comment below. We'd love to hear what you do. Absolutely. Now let's jump into pillar number three. A B one that as you mentioned, you're self proclaimed obsessed with <laughs> time and organisation. Mm. So investing your investing your time into creating more time for yourself. Let's unpack yeah. that. You're only ever going to find time for something if you create time for it. Um, everybody is pulled for time. It's the standard excuse I'd love to, but I'm busy. You know, and it's almost a badge of honor in today's society. Oh, you don't realize how busy, oh no, I'm busier. You know, you're, so, so you're winning the competition of busyness. The reality is, um, you know, being busy often means that your life can be out of control. And um, look, it's good to be, to be busy doing stuff, but if it's in the right way, not responsive, but in a structured way, I guess is is the key, and that that I think is is worth exploring. Um, being busy because things are out of control is a terrifying place. It's going to send you, yeah, mentally, it's going to burn you out very very quickly. You're going to feel very exhausted because your body, the chemical reaction in the brain and the body, like with cortisol release and things like that, with stress, is, is a huge killer. Uh, mentally, creativity wise, and overall health wise, to heart attacks and, and and various things in that space. So getting things under control is a really good way of reducing that kind of damaging busyness. Uh, uh, and so you know, having your diary, planning it out, getting things scheduled so you don't have to force them in, they're actually scheduled, uh, and creating the time for the things that are most important. You know, a lot of people will start the day with, um, you know, this is my, my to-do list. Uh, and all a to-do list is, it means you're going to be busy. It doesn't mean so you're going to be effective. You can get all that stuff done, but has it got you closer to your goal? And the answer is probably not. Taking the time to work out very deliberately, what is it you're trying to achieve today in these one hour or 30 minute or 10 minute slots that go through the day that on the grind is going to get you closer to where your overall goal and objective may be um, is, is absolutely crucial. And you have to take the time to do that. Yet when we're busy, spending time planning seems like it's a waste of time. I don't have time to plan. I just want to get started. Well, yes, but what you're getting started with may actually be quite ineffective at getting you where you want to be. So taking that five or 10 minutes first to plan out what you're going to do is a lot easier than just jumping headlong in. So a huge believer in that. In fact, we've built a, a, an entire sort of uh, ecosystem out with a money and investing um, planning system, uh, yeah, money and investing um, .com .au. You'll see there's a tag on there for the journal system. Get in there and have a look at it and it'll give you a really good black and white game plan, I suppose, that you can start to use to wrestle time. But you know, being organized it, it, it is crucial. And, and you know, as we lead in, I guess we're going to talk uh, shortly about the importance of finance and budgeting and so on. Planning things out. Let's just take a really simple example of this. Let's say you've got to go, go to the States, just been over there. And you know you're going to go in a certain date, say three months time. And a lot of people will just leave it and leave it and leave it. And then they end up booking their airfare or hotel at the last minute and have to pay a premium for that. Whereas by being a little bit more organized and, and structured with your planning, say, look, I've, in two and a half months time, I've got to go to Los Angeles. 
by locking in an airfare now and accommodation now, you're probably going to save yourself a little bit of money. And that money that you saved is free money. You're getting exactly the same service. You're using exactly the same flight. You arrive at exactly the same time. But you know you've got a bit of extra cash as well because you've been on the front foot and that goes in your budget or your investment account and you can get that to grow. And that's a simple example of you know, a, a, a quick and immediate dollar return on time. And it's, it's interesting you say that because we do this on a trading basis on the desk every day as well. You know, we have three parts we trade, the pre-trade, mm. the trade, and the post-trade. Mm. You'd think that most of your time would be spent actually on the trade itself. In reality, it's spent on the pre-trade yep. so that when it comes to actually hitting that button, it's all done for you and then you can then reflect for the next period, for the next trade. It makes a whole lot of sense and it can be applicable to pretty much all areas yep. of your life. Spending your time on the doing it, not the actual doing it, the planning and the preparation for it is key. And, and that's where you execute great results because you know, results only come from, from executing your plan and uh, getting on and actually executing it. Well, having a plan to start with and then executing it is key. So yeah, very, very important. So be organized, definitely. Totally. Well, let's talk about planning out a budget, mm. which is arguably what a lot of people struggle with is working out their finances, where to invest and how to budget. So in your experience, AB, where's a good starting point and what, what should you be aiming for long-term over that period? Mm. Doesn't sound a lot of fun, does it, budgeting? Um, and it's not the fun place by any stretch because if you get it right, it can actually open the door to, to, to having funds to, to have a lot of fun and colour. Knowing what you spend your money on uh, is key. Firstly, knowing what's coming in the door. Most people know what their salary is, um, but do they think about it in after-tax dollars? You know, I'm on 86 grand a year, okay? You're on 86 grand a year, but what does that actually mean? Net is you know, 58, 59 grand net, which is, you know, what, 1,200 bucks a week, 1,100 bucks a week. Um, there's your number. So let's now go through and very granular way breaking that apart what are your fixed costs accommodation uh, uh, and maybe if you've got some subscriptions phone plan that sort of stuff car repayments if you've got a car um, you know public transport ticket if you use a monthly ticket for that whatever it may be going through and stripping out your hard costs before you start and actually before you strip them out actually have a look and say okay where where can I save something on this, first of all? Because ultimately, I think a saving is as good as a profit. Um, you know, and it's not about being miserly or mean. It's just like, okay, where can, I, where can I save some money on this? Is there anywhere in my physical hard costs that I can save some cash? And this whole notion of saving is key uh, because the more you save, the more you get to invest. The more you get to invest, the bigger your returns. The bigger your returns, the quicker you can give it all away and retire. No, so this is just chicken and egg stuff, right? Then once you've gone through the, the, the fixed costs that you've got in there, then looking you know, objectively at, okay, with what's left, the discretionary spend that you have, what goes where? And, and again, that reality check, you know, a lot of people, for example, don't realize yeah, how many subscriptions that they have running. It could be for a magazine, could be for a gym, could be for a streaming service you don't really use much. Um, or, yeah, I'd say the big one is that gym membership. And, I mean, you've owned gyms, uh, as I have actually in the past. And, you know, usually there's a lead time um you know, several months when someone stopped going before they cancel that membership and it's just dead money. Um, getting onto that and cutting those sorts of things out is something that should be a, you know, a quarterly job, just making sure what's going out the door on a discretionary basis is is, is what you need, uh, need it to be. And again, that gives you money that you can save quite easily. Also, you know, being really accurate in what you spend your money on, there's no problem if you like going to the, the racetrack on a Saturday afternoon and spending a couple hundred bucks or you like going down the tab and doing the same thing. There's not a problem with that if it's part of your budget and you've allowed for it. Where it becomes a challenge is if it's something that's more of left field or that's out of control. And, and this is something that's really important. Know where your money is going and are you getting a good enough return on where you're spending your money? Is it giving you a sense of well-being? Do you enjoy spending it that way or is it just a bad habit that's kind of crept in or it's a legacy from the past or or whatever it may be? Um, so know where your money is going uh, and, and, and definitely work on siphoning off savings off the top you know, and I mean, that whole notion of paying yourself first is is key in business. Uh, and I think it's key from a, from an employee's perspective, too. So, you know, if you've got you know, X amount coming in your account each week, what can you stretch to in terms of straight off the bat, taking it out of that that account and putting it into a separate savings account so it's gone and you can't spend it is, is a great way of starting to accumulate savings from which you can then invest. Doesn't sound much fun. Um but you know, don't forget the goal is is not the savings; it's where it's going to take you long term. It's the process you want to fall in love with, not the uh, the immediacy of the result. So yeah. 
save now, do the hard work, and then later on in life, you can enjoy basically whatever you want if you get it right. 100%. Uh, I go back to the interview I did with my dad the other day. Um, yeah, my dad's 80. He stopped working when he was 57. So he's been retired for 23 years. He's still saving. Uh, he can't spend his money. And that's because then it's not because he had some um, inheritance. He had a very, very, very poor family. Um, and it's not that he had a high paying job either. He was just really super smart with what he did with his money uh, and certainly didn't waste it and, and, and spends his life literally traveling around the world. Tough life. Tough life. 23 yeah. years of travel and leisure. Yeah, just back, awesome. Just back from Italy. Wow. Yeah. Where you been? Couldn't get your way up in Italy. <laughs> All right, Amy, well, as we come to the end of the broadcast, mm. let's talk about the, the fifth and final, and that is investing in yourself. Mm. And that in particular means your skill set mm. and also your learning, because if you're not growing, you're dead. That's a classic soundbite I've heard you say so many times, but ultimately it's true, right? hundred percent. One of my uh, great friends and mentors, Tony Robbins, um, you know, if you're not growing, you're dead. Too true. And and there's always something, there's always something new to learn about everything you do. Um, you know, I've been in the trading space for 30 years and we've just um, launched our ETF uh, so uh, no, that came about when someone said to me, what would you do if you're starting again today? So there's always that self-examination of saying, okay, this is this is what I do differently, I guess, with the benefit of hindsight or with the accumulation of skill that I have or whatever, whatever it may be. Uh, and it's great to be, it's always good to be learning new things because mentally it's stretching you, it's keeping you in that information absorption phase as opposed to sort of sitting in the chair waiting to die and i appreciate that sounds a bit of a dire and and maybe you know fairly negative thing to say but some people that's my lot of you know that's it I've, I've, i'm retired or uh, this is just me there's always something new that you can learn uh, it could be a hobby it could be something that's a distraction which is good for your mental well-being you know organic gardening there you go that's one of my vices okay pretty good vice great to feed my family we've got a farm and having a great journey learning uh, a lot about you know the great things that you can do there learn an awful lot about what doesn't work too uh more recently uh, and so that's a that's an interest that's so outside of what i do for a living um yet is incredibly rewarding on multiple levels one it's a total decompression number two you know the upside to it is we grow great produce uh, number three it fosters a more healthy lifestyle for our kids and and, and livestock and all the, all the different things there so there's an example of something where you know 10 years ago if you tapped me on the shoulder and said oh you know what are your thoughts on organic gardening? I probably would have had other priorities. And what that shows is that I guess we're on a journey that evolves over time and doors open and need to open to continue to grow as a person. Um, so, yeah, learning new stuff is, is is really good. And for a lot of people that is in the investing space, you know, if I look at, say, for example, a podcast we published today, uh, which was about parents being too kind to their kids by, you know, giving them the deposit for a property, only to now discover that there's substantial risk associated with that that they probably hadn't considered. Uh, you've got to dig the well before you need the water. Learn about this stuff. Learn about being an investor. Learn about asset protection. Learn about the tax implications of these things. Learn about what the risk of cross-collateralization is before you do it. So there's always going to be something new that you can learn out there. And if you learn and absorb that information and then apply it, that's where growth really comes from. There's no point afterwards looking in the rearview mirror, oh, I could have done that or I probably should have done that. It's too late. It's already done. So yeah, huge focus on skill set. So if you don't know anything about trading and investing, learn about trading and investing because giving you money to a fund manager is a dumb decision. Why do I say that? Not because I've got any extra to grind. I've been a fund manager. The reality is 80% plus of fund managers underperform the index over a five-year period, according Scary. to CanStar. So why would you give some money to someone that's going to underperform and charge you for it. Take that money, invest in yourself, learn how to do it. You've got the most vested interest in, in your finances anyway. And not only have you got a chance of outperforming, but you've also got an opportunity to learn a life skill which will set you free for the rest of your life. Simple example. It's, it's great advice, AB, and even in just listening to you here, I'm sure our listeners will agree, is that as you talk about each of those five points, it's amazing how each of them complement one another. And there's sound bites which relate <laughs> to each individual component as one sort of overarching message is that having your life under control is key. Yeah, I'm not sure they all actually help each other. I'm just thinking, one of what are you talking about learning new skills? And I love wine. I've been learning. Um, it's been a lot, <laughs> lot, probably a 25, 30 year journey into learning more about wine and uh, and so on. I was very fortunate after I, I graduated from university. My girlfriend at the time worked for, for Chateau Latour in France, which is one of the best shadows in the world. And so I got very spoiled very early on. And it's been a been an interest level for a while. How it actually contributes to your overall health, I'm not so sure. Because one glass a night's meant to be okay. Yeah, one glass a night 
Tide's pretty good. It's a little bit heavier than that over the weekend. We had a bit of entertaining over the weekend, plus Mother's Day as well. So yeah, there was a, there was a bit more consumed than normal. So probably that one would have been at odds from uh, uh, from the health and well-being uh, perspective. But I guess from a, a relaxation point of view, from a mental health, maybe it did work. Who knows? Drink wine, invest in your relationships, right? Yeah, we don't need any more kids. And unfortunately, wine, kids and relationships are the three things that you need to be very careful <laughs> on how you put them together. Maybe that's an awesome way to finish. Thank it's you so much. probably more information than we needed, I think. So that's yeah, okay. good place to stop. Thanks very much. Cheers, AB. There you have it, guys. Make sure you give us a review and a rating so we can get this message out to more people. And we'll look forward to hosting you next week.